Settings related to mixer connections, including routings of inputs to tracks for recording, or for determining where signals are output, even for determining which outputs are to be monitored, can be set up, stored and recalled easily within the 1680 using the easy routing feature. There are two types of easy routing. Template, wherein you can change and check the various settings from a single listing, and step edit, in which you can change the settings in order using a question and answer dialogue type format. Let's take a look at the template approach. Press the easy routing button over here. Three icons appear on the screen and you need to highlight one of these depending on whether you wish to create a template for recording, mix down or bouncing. Then press page until you see these function key options. From here we can directly access input mixer, track mixer, effects and master block parameters. Use the cursor controls to move around and make parameter adjustments using the value dial. Sometimes the enter button will flash upon highlighting a particular parameter. Press it to open a small window for further parameter adjustment and press no exit to close the window. These are all the same parameters that we've looked at already, but in easy routing they're gathered together in these few easy to read pages. Once the template has been set up, it needs to be saved into one of the 29 template memories. Press F6 for save. The display asks us to name the template. First, select the template number, 1 in this case. Next, use the cursor controls and value dial to print the user template name. Note that the name can be typed directly from the select buttons and status buttons in typewriter style. If we press this button, marked numerics. The function keys allow us to delete letters, insert letters, or clear the whole name. Pressing the history function on F1 will take us through a register of the last 20 names entered, one at a time. Useful if you're creating a number of templates whose names differ by maybe only one character. When you're finished, press right on F5, and then play to return to the play condition. Now if you press the easy routing button again, you will notice that a new icon has been added. This is the template that we just created. To recall the user routing, simply highlight it using the cursor controls, then page round until you see Execute on F4. Press F4 twice and confirm by pressing Yes, Enter. The template is then applied. Alternatively, you can opt for Step Edit. Press Easy Routing and then find Execute on F4. Choose the appropriate starting point on F1, F2 or F3 and then simply follow the on-screen prompts. Move forward through each step by pressing F2 until the setup is complete. And then follow the naming and saving procedure shown above. Your user templates are stored permanently in the VS1680, independently of the song. This makes them different from the scene memories which are stored as part of the song. The templates are handy for storing frequently used mixer setups. And a user template can be deleted by highlighting a template icon, pressing F6 delete, followed by yes, enter to confirm. In the effects section, 100 user memory locations are available for storing your own customized effects. It's always a good idea to start with a preset that's close to the effect you want and then edit the effect in order to tailor it to your exact needs. All of the effects pages in the 1680 are based on one of 34 algorithms. An algorithm determines the composition and structure of an effect. And you can find a list of available algorithms in the appendices. Well, let's try editing one of the delay effects. Shift F3 for Effect Board A menu, F1 for Effect 1, and F2 for Patch Select. Preset P23 is a basic delay or echo, and uses the delay algorithm as denoted by the prefix DL, shown here. Select the effect with Execute on F4. This returns us to the previous display, where a structure diagram shows us the connection order of the components of the effect algorithm. In this case, a delay block and an EQ block. We can use the cursor to highlight either block and then press the flashing enter button 
or edit on F3 to access the parameters of that particular block. The parameters appear and using the cursor controls and the value dial we can make the changes. When using delays it's often a good idea to try and synchronize the delay repeats with the song tempo and to do this we need to adjust the delay time. This is a stereo delay which can have different delay times for left and right channels. So I'm going to set the delay shift to zero and set the delay time to 300 milliseconds. The other block parameters are available by pressing the next block buttons on F1 and F2. Now so far these changes are only temporary. If I select another patch then return to this one the settings will have reverted to their factory preset values. In order to save the changes I could store a scene which will capture all temporary effect settings as well as the mixer setup. Alternatively, I can save the modified patch to a user memory location. This means that the patch is stored in the 1680 rather than as part of the song, and so is accessible within any project. Press F4 Save. A user location is automatically assigned, but you can change it at this point. Next, write the new patch name. Then press F5 Write to store the patch. You can then check the patch listing to confirm the presence of your new modified patch. Sooner or later you're going to want to start a new project from scratch. To do this you must first prepare a new song. Go into the song menu and page round if necessary until you see song new above F2. Pressing this takes us to the initial song parameters. We need to define the song's sample rate, and I recommend that you use 44.1 kHz, as this allows transfer of audio from CD in the digital domain. Also, the burning of audio CDs from the 1680 song using the VSCDR is only possible for songs recorded at 44.1 kHz. Next, we need to select a recording mode for the song. Well, the VS880 uses a special coding technique allowing more audio to be stored to the drive than would normally be expected. Six recording modes are offered. MTP, or Multitrack Pro, gives very high sound quality and allows roughly 808 track minutes of recording time on a 2.1 gigabyte drive at the 44.1 kHz sample rate. This is the default mode and the one you would normally choose. The master mode uses the format of CD or DAT and gives half the recording time of MTP. In this mode, the 1680 will function as an 8-track recorder. Tracks 9 to 16 cannot be used. This mode is appropriate when compiling and editing stereo files imported from CD or DAT. The remaining modes offer varying degrees of coding, Live 2 giving the longest recording time of about 1,616 track minutes on the 2.1 gig drive. Incidentally, when we talk about track minutes, we mean the amount of recording time available if we were to record continuously on just one track. To find the practical recording time, we have to divide the number of track minutes by the number of tracks used in the song. Moving on, we can choose whether to retain the system parameters or even the mixer and scene parameters from the current song. Finally, we can set an icon type to represent the song when viewed in the song select directory. The song parameters have been set and at this stage it's a good idea to name the song by pressing F1. If you don't name the song it will automatically be given a default name as shown up here. So let's name the song. Then press right on F5 followed by execute on F4. Confirm by pressing yes enter, store current, no. Before you start recording into a new song, it's a good idea to create a tempo map for the song. This way, recording can be done with reference to the measure and beat display, and we can even play along to a built-in metronome. This makes editing and synchronization much easier, as we shall see later on. Go to the system menu and select Sync above F6 on page 1. On F3, select Tempo Map. Here we can set the initial tempo of the song in beats per minute. We can also define the number of beats per measure. New tempo maps can be created by pressing F2. These allow tempo and measure length changes at the specified measure number here.
tempo maps can also be deleted or inserted. On playback, the measure and beat display will follow the tempo map exactly. The metronome can be switched on in system menu F5. We have a choice of internal metronome, which incidentally is only output from the monitor output, or MIDI metronome, whereby a MIDI note is transmitted from the MIDI out socket. The metronome can be set to sound during recording only, or during recording and playback, and it sounds like this. Let's now take a look at the different ways we can edit our recorded material. We'll start with some typical track edits. Here I've created a new song and recorded a simple four bar drum pattern onto tracks one and two. Let's have a listen. I intend to use this pattern to form the underlying rhythm part of my new song. Now I already know that the tempo of the pattern is 101 beats per minute, and so to make editing easier, I've already defined a tempo map for the song. Unfortunately, at this point, even though the tempos match, the drum pattern does not line up with the measure and beat display, as you can hear if I switch on the metronome. We need to move the recorded pattern until it sounds in time with the metronome count, and I find this the easiest way to do it. Start by switching the metronome off. Before I go into the edit pages, I'm going to mark the exact beginning and end of the drum pattern using two locate points, as these will help me when I make the edit. To find the start point, I'm going to use the scrub facility. This editing tool allows you to sweep a very short audio loop backwards and forwards in order to home in on the desired edit point. In this case, we need to hunt for the very start of the audio. To select a track for scrubbing, use the cursor up and down controls to highlight track numbers in the playlist. Only one track can be scrubbed at a time. To switch scrub on, press the scrub button in the preview section over here. We can now move the scrub loop point by making the now time display active and rotating the value dial. Note that the underlined time component, whether it be hours, minutes, seconds, frames or subframes, will affect the scrub resolution. For the finest possible resolution, select subframe scrubbing and rotate the dial whilst holding shift. This will give a scrub resolution of around one three thousandth of a second. Scrub to just before the audio starts, then rotate the dial clockwise until you hear the clicking of the onset of the audio. Mark this point using a locate button. Press stop to leave scrub mode. Now you know that the drum pattern starts at exactly this point. Once you think you've found an edit point, you can check it using the preview to, from and through controls over here. These controls allow you to play a small snippet of audio either up to, away from, or through the edit point. Once the start point has been found, the same can be done for the end point. Note that the scrub loop can be set to scrub to the edit point or scrub from the edit point. This is defined by pressing either the preview to button or the preview from button immediately before going into scrub. Now we've found the start and end points of the pattern, we can go into edit. Shift F2 takes us to the track edit menu. Notice that above F1 we can choose either a track edit approach or a phrase edit approach. Well, we'll look at phrase editing in a while, but for now I'll highlight track. Press F3 for track move. Page round if you don't see it. The track move edit display appears. The first thing we need to do is select the particular track or tracks that we wish to move. And this can be done in two ways. I need to select tracks one and two and I can use the track select buttons in the mixer section to do this. The track status buttons underneath light red to show that we have elected to move tracks one and two 
back onto tracks one and two, but at a different time location. At this point, I could decide not only to move these tracks in time, but also to other tracks. This is done by pressing the status buttons of other tracks, like this. Now, tracks one and two would be moved to tracks three and four. However, I want to keep the same track locations, so back to tracks one and two as destinations. Alternatively, I can press F1 for select track. Here, all the track names are shown, and I can select for editing a highlighted track by pressing mark on F3. Since in this case tracks 1 and 2 are linked, the tracks are automatically selected as a pair. Press F1 again to return to the main edit display. Next we have to enter the edit points into the windows shown. Use the cursor up and down controls to highlight the start window. Here we enter the start time of the audio to be moved, either in absolute time or in measures and beats. However, since we've just marked the exact start time with one of our locate buttons, we can enter the value directly. Press the locate button. The now time display shows the locate position. Press now on F2 and the start window will capture the now time value. Cursor down to the end window and press the second locate button, followed by now to capture the end point. The from point is the point which will end up at the to point once the edit has been carried out. And for this example, in which we want to shift the very start of the audio to a new location, the from point must be the same as the start point. So once again, locate 1 followed by now on F2. Finally, we define the to point. This is where we want the audio to move to, and for my purposes, I need it to be right at the beginning of the song. Measure 1, beat 1, like this. Now all I need to do to complete the edit is to press F4, execute. Return to the play condition and press play. The part now starts at the beginning of the song and I can check how well it lines up with the measure beat display by switching on the metronome and playing back. Sometimes there are situations where you are moving or copying audio that contains a reference point which is not actually at the start of the audio, but which nevertheless needs to be moved or copied to a specific time location. An example of this might be the sound effect of a ticking alarm clock. Although the whole sound effect may need to be moved or copied, it is the alarm going off that is the important cue point. This is therefore made the from point, allowing it to be placed at the to point by the edit. Now that we have four perfect measures at the top of the song, we can use track copy to seamlessly copy the pattern to make a drum loop which will run throughout the whole song. Once again, shift F2 and select track copy on F2. We again select the track for editing in the same way as before. You can see that the copy parameters are pretty much the same as the move parameters, with the addition of the copy time window, which allows us to define how many copies of the pattern we make. Set this now. 10 times will give me 10 times 4 measures, in addition to the original 4, which is a total of 44 measures. Now specify the edit points. The start point is the top of the song, measure 1, beat 1. The end point is the end of the pattern, that is, measure 5, beat 1. The from point is the same as the start point. And since we want a clean loop, the to point is going to be the same as the end point at measure 5, beat 1. Execute on F4 and return to the play condition. The playlist shows much more audio than we started with. However, the copying process has used no extra space on the drive. This is an important property of the non-destructive editing technology used in the 1680. If you're not happy with the edit, it of course can be undone. Now that the drum pattern has been copied to create the drum track, we can treat it as a continuous performance and overdub other instruments onto the remaining tracks as before. Remember that the copy edit can be used on any recorded material, especially useful in situations such as the one in which you copy one perfect vocal take in a chorus section to every other chorus in the song.
The track cut facility is very useful when editing dialogue. Track cut will not only remove the audio, but also the space that it occupied, just like tape editing with razor blades. Except, of course, that in the 1680, we can undo our edits if they don't work out. Let's try removing just one word from this piece of dialogue. The word I wish to edit out is digital at the end of the sentence. The sophisticated digital editing functions offer fully non-destructive editing, which is not possible with tape-based digital recorders. Non-destructive editing. I'll mark the start of the word as best I can using locate one. Then scrub to find the start more accurately. Clear the locate point and drop a new one. Then find the end of the word and mark with locate 2. It's sometimes useful to see a graphical representation of the audio as well as hear it. We can do this by opening the wave display on F5. Page round if you don't see this option. The scrub area and length is denoted by the dotted line under the waveform and you can clearly see the various syllables in the dialogue. Zoom in and out vertically and horizontally using F1 to F4. You can remove the wave display by pressing F5 once again. OK, now into track cut with Shift F2 followed by F6. Fewer parameters this time. Once again, select the track to be edited. We can enter the start and end points of the cut in the same way as we did before, but there is a shortcut way of doing this that I find particularly fast when performing track cuts. Press locate button number one, then press locate one again whilst holding down shift. You can see that under the locate one button is written the word start as a shift operation. This enters the now time directly into the start window. Press locate two, then shift locate two to enter the end point directly. And finally press execute on F4. Return to the play condition and check the results. The sophisticated digital editing functions offer fully non-destructive editing, which is not possible with tape-based recorders. Every time we drop in and out of record, a phrase is created, and of course a track can be made up of one or more phrases. For this reason, we have the option to edit phrases instead of tracks. Phrases have the advantage that their start and end points are defined by their actual phrase boundaries. So for example, when performing a phrase move edit, only the from and to points need to be defined. Well, let's create some phrases by recording the numbers 1 to 5, dropping in and out between each number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The playlist shows five blocks of audio. These are the phrases. We can move between the phrase boundaries using shift and next previous over here. Each phrase is highlighted when the now timeline reaches its boundary. And at this point, the phrase can be named by going into the phrase edit menu, shift F2, F1 to select phrase edit, page number two, F4, name. Highlight the phrase to name, then press F1 name. Follow the same procedure as for track naming. I'm now going to name each of the five phrases. Let's try deleting the third phrase. Into the phrase edit menu. Page one, F6, delete. Highlight the phrase using the shift next previous and the up and down cursor controls. Mark using F3 and press execute. The phrase is deleted. New phrases can be created at any time from any take that has been recorded into the song, whether it is currently on the playlist or not. Previously recorded takes or takes that were recorded over will only be available if the song has not been optimized. To create a new phrase, go to the phrase edit menu, select from page two, F3, new. 
All of the available text can be viewed by highlighting the take window and rotating the dial. Information showing the original start and end times, as well as the time and date of the take, is shown below. If you press F1, you will see a complete listing of available takes. And by highlighting one, you can audition it by pressing play in the transport. Two. Two. When you've found the correct take, press select on F4. Then decide where you'd like to put the take in terms of V-Track destination and time location. If you press original on F5, the take will be placed exactly where it was when it was first recorded. A really neat feature when trying to choose between a range of alternative takes. Using marker points to define the boundaries of different sections within a song, we can rearrange the order of the song data quickly and easily using the song arrange function. This is great for trying out different song formats and remixes without having to go through all the stages of the cut, move and copy edits. I can best demonstrate this using my five phrases once again. Start by dropping marker points at the section boundaries, in this case six markers defining five different sections. Next go into the song menu. Select Song Arrange on F6 from page 1. The new arrangement is going to be defined as a number of different parts and the part number is shown here in the top left. We have to define what part 1 is going to be, that is, between which markers. Press F1 New and dial in the Start marker for part 1. The marker time location is shown to the right. Let's go for marker 3. Next, cursor to the end marker and let's select marker 4. Press F1 New or enter to move on to part 2 and repeat the procedure, defining other parts. Up to 99 parts can be defined and parts can be deleted on F3 or all parts cleared on F2. Once you've listed the new arrangement, you can decide where to place it by setting the destination time. Now, if you don't adjust this, then the new arrangement will automatically be placed at the current song end, so that you can compare the original arrangement with the new. Press F5 to execute and confirm with Yes, Enter. Looking now at the playlist, we can see the new material, but just as with the copy edit, no extra space has been used on the drive. Four, five, four, three, three. As mentioned earlier, when operations such as overdubbing and punch in recording are repeated, the old data will remain on the disk drive. In some cases, significant amounts of memory can be occupied by this unnecessary data, decreasing the available space on the drive and shortening the length of time available for recording. Deleting this unnecessary data from the drive and thus freeing up disk space is called song optimize. This operation cannot be undone with the undo feature, so be sure that you won't need those previous takes before you carry out the operation. To optimize a song, go to the song menu. On page one, press F5, optimize, followed by F4, execute, and confirm twice with enter yes. If you now recheck your available recording time, it may well have increased. At some stage, you may wish to delete the demo songs from the drive to further free up disk space. Once again, this operation cannot be undone. Here's how to do it. Into the song menu, select F6 Song Arrays on page 2. Highlight the song or songs to be erased by marking each song using F3. Press Execute and confirm twice with Enter Yes. It is possible to link the VS1680 via MIDI to another playback device and have them both play back in time with one another using one of the types of sync code, MIDI timecode or MIDI clock. MIDI timecode is the MIDI equivalent of SMPT code and is time-based, giving a lock to hours, minutes, seconds, frames and subframes. We would use MTC when syncing two hard disk recorders together since disk recorders tend not to be able to sync to MIDI clock.
Let's try syncing the VS1680 to another hard disk recorder, the Roland VS880. We have to decide which machine will be the master device and which machine will be the slave device. Well, I'll take the 1680 as master. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I've recorded a backing track onto the 1680, and it sounds like this. I've also recorded a rhythm guitar part onto track one of the VS-880, and it sounds like this. Both the 1680 song and the 880 song have the same initial tempo map of 110 beats per minute, and the audio for both songs starts at measure two. This is a good idea since it gives a whole measure for the synchronization to stabilize. Now to get the two units to play together, we need to connect MIDI out from the master to MIDI in on the slave using an ordinary MIDI lead. Next we need to make various settings. First to the master device. Shift F5 takes us into system menu. Select F6 sync. Here we can define whether the 1680 sync source is internal or external. Since the 1680 is master, we set this to internal. We can also set the MIDI timecode frame rate. Now this must be set the same on both master and slave machines, otherwise synchronization is not possible. The default setting is 30 frames per second, and you would normally use this. However, it can be changed to conform to video and film frame rates, if need be. Next, set the kind of code that will be generated, MTC in this case. Now that's all we have to do in the sync section of the master device. Next we go to the MIDI parameters. Exit, F4. First check the device ID. This needs to be set the same as for the receiving device, the default value being 17. Check that MIDI through is set to out. The transmission of MIDI system exclusive messages needs to be enabled, and this is done here. SysX, TX, on. And finally, we need to switch on the transmission of MMC, or MIDI machine control. This will allow us to remotely control the transport of the slave machine. It will also allow locate points and markers to be properly followed by the slave. Now to the slave. Set the sync to external for MTC at 30 frames per second. Set MIDI machine control to slave and make sure that it has been set to receive MIDI system exclusive messages and that the exclusive ID number is set to that of the master, 17 in this case. We should now be in business. Put the master into play and the two units should run together in sync. MIDI Clock is a tempo-based sync code which uses 24 MIDI messages per quarter note to provide sync. Many MIDI sequencers support MIDI Clock and I've found that using the 1680 as master and slaving your sequencer via MIDI Clock works well and is a very musical way of working. The MIDI Clock generated by the 1680 corresponds exactly to the tempo map of the song. To set up the sync we need to go back to our sync display and set Sync Gen to MIDI Clock. Since the MIDI clock data contains remote commands for play, stop and continue, as well as song position pointers for location, MMC need not be used. Let's try it. I have a sequence on the workstation which sounds like this. And a guitar part on the 1680 which sounds like this. I then connect MIDI out from the 1680 to MIDI in on the workstation. Then set the sequencer in the workstation to slave to MIDI clock. Return to zero, play, and once again we have sync. If your MIDI sequence is put together before the audio components are recorded on the 1680 and it contains intricate tempo changes, the 1680 can be made to learn the tempo map of the sequence so that it can later control the sequencer by the same map. To do this, simply connect MIDI out from the sequencer to MIDI in on the 1680. 
Go into the 1680 system menu and select Sync on F6. Press F1 for Sync Track Record. The display shows that the unit is waiting for incoming MIDI clock messages. Start the sequence and the 1680 will learn the sequence tempo map. Then simply reverse the MIDI connections and set the sync gen of the 1680 to sync track rather than MIDI clock. The 1680 will now drive the sequence recording to the original sequence tempo map. If you put together your audio tracks before the MIDI sequence and the audio is of unknown or variable tempo, you can create a tempo map to fit the audio after recording it using the tap tempo feature. This involves you tapping the tap button in time with the music, thereby dropping markers at every quarter note interval or any other interval you wish to choose. We can then convert these marker points into a new tempo map. To do this, go to Sync in the system menu and press F2. Sync track convert. Select Tap to Tempo Map Convert on F2. Specify the desired time signature and the number of beats that you tapped out in one measure. Press F5 Execute and confirm that you wish to overwrite the existing sync track and or tempo map. Make sure that sync gen is set to MIDI clock and a new tempo map is created which follows your taps. During mixdown, it is possible to automate input mixer and track mixer settings in real time. The specific parameters over which the automation has control are fader positions, channel panning, effects and aux panning, effects and aux send and return levels, and effects patch selection. Well, there are three kinds of automation provided, so let's take a look at each of these in turn. The first is real-time automation. Let's go back to the demo song Take Me Away to explore this feature. Make sure that the song protect is switched off, otherwise auto mix recording will be prohibited. Press the auto mix button to switch auto mix on. Next, hold down the scene button whilst pressing record. Auto mix record flashes in the top right hand corner of the display. Start playback and make fader adjustments. When you stop playback, the display reads working, and when you return to the playlist, you can see lots of markers have been added to the Automix region. These are Automix markers, and they're differentiated from ordinary markers by a small letter A next to the marker number. Play back again, and you will find that all of your fader movements are reproduced. Automix recording can be repeated over the same section many times, perhaps recording individual fader movements one at a time. If a previously automated fader is moved during Automix record, then the new movement will overwrite the old data. This is a great feature as it allows complicated dynamic mixes to be built up in stages rather than having to be performed in a single pass. The real-time automation is able to control fader positions, monitor out level and effects patch selection only. Each mixer channel can be targeted for auto mix playback and record, playback only, or no auto mix using the channel select buttons. Hold the auto mix button and press the select button of the target channel. A flashing select button means the channel is enabled for auto mix record and playback. Off disables auto mix, and continuous means enabled for auto mix playback only. Sometimes you may wish to remove the master output fader from the automation process. This will also exclude the monitor output control from automation. If you want to delete an automix, simply clear all markers with Shift, Clear, Tap, and confirm with Yes. Another type of automation is snapshot automation. In this case, the automation is discrete rather than continuous. 
A mix is set up and then a snapshot is placed at a specific time location using a single auto mix marker. Great for instantly changing the mix at a certain point, maybe the transition between verse and chorus. To drop a snapshot marker, make sure that auto mix button is lit and then at the correct time location, hold down scene and press tap. The marker appears and now whenever the song reaches this point, the mix is reproduced. Using snapshot automation, we can also automate panning and aux or effects send and return levels. We have a third type of automation which allows us to set up two snapshot markers and then have the 1680 automatically interpolate continuous mix data between them, allowing a smooth transition from one mix to the other. This is particularly useful for fade outs and cross fades. Well, let's try it. I'll snapshot at measure 5 with the master fader at 0. Then snapshot again at measure 8 with the fader all the way down. Then I hold down scene whilst pressing previous. The display asks if we want to gradate between markers 1 and 2. Press yes and the 1680 will insert markers to produce a smooth fade out. Let's have a listen. We can make detailed edits to the Automix data using the Automix microscope. This is found in the utility menu, page 1, F5, F2. First target a particular Automix parameter, track channel 1 level for example. Then press F2 and use the value dial to edit the data associated with individual Automix markers. The changes are implemented straight away and do not have to be stored. Remember that the input mixer can also be automated. This allows us to route audio from external sound sources, such as MIDI sound modules, through the input mixer, giving us automated control not only of the playback tracks, but the MIDI sources as well. The final mix will therefore be a combination of recorded tracks and live MIDI sources, all running together. If you're not using any live inputs during mix down, make sure that the input mix levels are down, as you don't want any open channels contributing to the mix. The EQ can be very useful, especially when putting together a final mix. The 1680 provides separate EQ for each input and track channel in the mixer. To access EQ for a particular channel, press the appropriate channel select button, then highlight the EQ window. The EQ can be switched on or off using the dial. A choice of two band or three band parametric EQ is provided. The two band gives cut and boost for high and low ranges the center frequencies of which can be adjusted. A graphical representation of the EQ curve is shown by pressing enter. The three band EQ gives an additional mid frequency range. This is a true parametric mid as it allows not only the center frequency to be changed but also the width of the affected region. This is called the Q and you can see how the EQ curve changes as I increase or decrease the Q. Think of the EQ as a sophisticated set of tone controls. During a mix we can use the EQ to create separation between the different parts by emphasizing their own characteristic frequency components. For linked pairs the same EQ will be applied to both channels. Note that three band EQ cannot be applied to both input and track channels of the same number. Well, let's try applying some EQ to the drums and listen as I sweep the mid-frequency control. Permanently and reliably, it's always wise to back up your work to an external storage medium for safekeeping. This can be done using DAT by connecting the VS1680 digital output, optical or coaxial, to the digital input on the DAT machine, and then recording to the DAT the information generated by the 1680. The whole song is backed up in its complete multi-track format, just as though it were being saved to the internal drive. The process does, however, take a relatively large time to complete. For DAT backup, 
go into the utility menu and select F6 for DAT backup and follow the on-screen prompts. Recovery from DAT is simply a reverse procedure. For DAT recover, go into utility and select F1 on page 2. VS1680 songs can be backed up to external SCSI devices, such as ZIP or the VSCDR. This allows for a very fast and reliable backup and is the recommended backup method. When using SCSI devices connected to the 1680 SCSI port, we must first set the SCSI ID number of the connected device. If you look on the back of your SCSI device, you should see a way of switching the ID number. This number allows the 1680 to identify and communicate with the device and differentiate it from other devices in the SCSI chain. Each device in a chain must have a unique ID number. The 1680 also has an ID number known as the self-ID number and this can be changed in the global system area but is normally set to 7. ID numbers run from 0 to 7 so up to 7 other devices can be chained together. Set the backup device to a different ID number to the 1680 and any other connected device. We must next consider the termination. The last device in the chain must be terminated to prevent possible data transmission error. Some devices have built-in terminators which can be switched on or off and some devices require an additional terminator block. Either way, make sure that the last device in the chain is terminated. Now in order for the 1680 to recognize attached devices it must scan the SCSI bus and in fact it does this automatically whenever it is switched on. It can only see however devices that are powered up so it's very very important that you always turn on external devices before switching on the VS1680. When backing up to a removable drive you must use the song copy playable or song archives store functions found on page two of the song menu. If the song to be backed up is small enough to be copied to one removable disc or cartridge, then use Song Copy Playable. Here's how to do it. A new removable disc must first be initialized. To do this, first insert the disc into the drive. Next, go to Utility and select Drive Initialize on F6, page 2. The 1680 will scan the SCSI bus and then you can select the drive to be initialized, in this case SCSI ID5. Now be very careful not to initialize the internal drive as this will obviously delete all the songs on the drive. Press F4 execute and confirm twice with enter yes and store the current song if changes have been made to it. Once the disk is initialized, it's ready for backup. Go to the song menu and press F1 for song copy playable. Mark the song or songs to be copied using cursor controls and F3 mark. Multiple songs can be copied in one go or one at a time. If you want to use the same disk to store many songs, then make sure that the Erase All Songs is off, otherwise each new song that is saved will first initialize the disk, erasing all previously stored songs. Next, press F5 to select the backup drive. The 1680 scans the SCSI bus and gives a display of all the recognized devices. Select the removable drive with the cursor controls, in this case SCSI ID 5. Press F1 to return to the previous display. Check that the information shown is correct, then press F4 execute and confirm with enter. Store current no. The song is now copied to the external drive and this can be made to the current drive to allow playback of the song directly rather than from the internal drive. To do this you must go to drive select in the utility menu and change the current drive selection. 
To restore a song to the internal drive at a later date, simply reverse the procedure and copy the song from the external drive to the internal drive. Note that the source drive must always be the current drive. Now if the song to be backed up is too large to fit on one disc, the 1680 will tell you so by showing disc memory full. If this is the case, then you can use the song copy archive store function to copy the song over multiple discs. The procedure is the same as before except that you will be prompted to change discs during the copying process. Obviously, a song backed up in this way cannot be played back directly from the external drive. It must first be restored into the internal drive using Song Archives Extract. This is found in the Song menu on F3, page 2. By far the most cost-effective backup medium to date is CDR backup. Using the optional VSCDR, you can backup your work in multi-track form to standard blank CDR discs. Song data backed up on CDR discs cannot be rewritten, therefore it's an appropriate procedure for backing up completed song data in its final form. CDR discs allow a massive 650 megabytes of storage, so you can happily back up multiple songs at once. However, unlike song copy playable to removable discs, once the CDR has been burned, it is finalized and cannot be added to at a later date. An alternative to the CDR disc is the more expensive CDRW or rewritable disc. These can be rewritten and so are also very useful for data backup. CDR backup and recover are found in the utility menu. The VSCDR can also be used to create audio CDs which will play back on any standard audio CD player. Only songs with a sample rate of 44.1 kHz can be written as audio CDs. The audio which is actually printed to the CDR is the audio contained in any two 1680 tracks. These are selectable and would normally be a stereo pair of tracks. Well, since the audio is taken directly from the track contents, any post-track EQ, effects, panning, or mixer level changes will have absolutely no effect on the audio ending up on the CDR. For this reason, it is important that you make sure that audio levels on the source tracks are as high as possible without clipping. Check them by looking at the pre-fade track metering during playback. Also, since two source tracks are used to create the CD audio, the song must first be mixed down to these source tracks. Well, this can be done internally by bouncing maybe 14 tracks down to two, or it can be done by mixing the song down to a DAT machine and then recording the DAT mix back onto two tracks of a new song within the 1680. When creating CDs containing many songs, the 1680 source tracks need to be compiled and edited to form the coherent and continuous finished master. Then song markers need to be placed at the start of every song. To this, hold down the play display button and press tap. A marker is dropped and the display shows the marker number with a little C designating it a song marker. These are needed to allow track selection when playing back the final CD. Note that the CD can contain a maximum of 99 songs and that no song marker is required for the first song. Simply place the song as close to the 1680 zero time position as possible. If only one song is being recorded to the CDR, no song markers are required. To burn the audio CD, go to the song menu and select F3 CD Write on page 3. First we select the source tracks by pressing F1 and you can see that any pair of V-tracks can be source. Make the selection, then press F1 again. Before the audio CD can be played back on a conventional CD player, it must be finalized. You can decide here whether to finalize automatically after the CD has been burned, or to finalize at a later date, allowing songs to be added to the CDR one by one. Remember that the CDR cannot be written to once it has been finalized. To write and finalize in one go, turn finalize on. Press F4 execute and confirm with yes. A note relating to licensing appears. Press yes if you agree to the conditions. And the process begins. 
After writing the CD, you have the option to write another straight away. If you want to, place another blank CDR in the drive and press yes. The contents of any recorded performance will be lost if you simply turn off the power. This may even result in damage to the hard disk. To safely turn off the power and be sure that your recordings are saved, always follow the shutdown procedure. While holding down shift, press shut, eject, stop. Confirm by pressing yes, enter. And then decide whether to store current. When shutdown has been completed properly, Power Off Restart appears in the display. At this point, the power can be switched off. Discs used with Roland's VS880 and VS840 models can also be used by the 1680. However, because of the differences in the structure of the disk space and the song data on disks that can be used, there are a number of precautions concerning the loading and saving of data that should be observed. Song data recorded on the later VS880EX can also be used by the 1680, following the same rules as for VS880 song data. Song discs used by the VS880 can be recognised and played back by the VS1680 but the songs cannot be edited or restored. To do this, you must use the song import function found in the song menu. Once the song is imported, it is treated as though it is an original 1680 song and can be edited and saved as such. Discs used by the VS840 are not directly compatible with the 1680, so song import must be used. When VS880 data is converted, all of the song data, including mixer and system settings, are copied. When VS840 data is converted, only the track audio is copied. Well, that's just about all we've got time for, so happy recording, and until next time, bye-bye.